Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You really captivate this audience. In a way, um, thank you. You know, maybe we should just get going and sure. You want to sit start, up there? Or start what? acting. Yeah, but I think yeah, because I think we want to talk a little okay. bit. Okay. We can't let you go yet. We just simply can't. As you wish. Have a seat. That's mighty nice of you to have my books out here. Yeah, and I've read them all. You know. I appreciate that. We're talk that. about them. Thank you. Mr. Al Gore, I just can't, you know, resist this temptation to ask you this one question. Now, you have uh, the Oscar, you have the Nobel Peace Prize, you are the climate hero. Would you trade it all for the presidency? <laughs> <laughs> uh, pe people are... <laughs> <laughs> I had people, to ask you. People are very kind uh, when they will say something to the effect, do you think you've been able to? <laughs> to do more this way. And, and my answer is always the same. I'm under no illusion that there is any role or job or position in the world with as much potential for bringing about positive change a, as the presidency of the U.S. So I, I uh, uh, it was not to be, and so I looked for ways to serve uh, in, in a different uh, capacity. And I am a lucky person, I truly am. And it is a joy for me, the subject matter at times is very heavy. Uh, some of these destructive consequences are difficult to talk about. Uh, but the excitement is real when we look at how we're beginning to solve this. But for me personally, it, 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 it truly is a joy to have work that feels as if it justifies every ounce of energy that I can pour into it. Many of you feel the same way about y y your, your work, and when you find something that is really fulfilling to you, that, that's, that's a blessing. You've talked today about the voice of nature, and you've been engaged and passionate about the environment issue ever since you were a kid and, a, and when you were a college student at Harvard. You've written the, you started writing the book, Earth in Balance. Now, what is it that drives you? Mm. Um, as a young boy, my, I, I followed my father around on our farm. I, I grew up partly in Washington, D.C. because my father was in elected office. But every summer was on the farm, and his generation was uh, traumatized by the Dust Bowl and the soil erosion crisis, and he taught me when I was very young about how to take care of the land. When I was a teenager, my mother read aloud from Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, and that expanded my way of thinking. But it, when I was a college student, I had the great good fortune to walk into a lecture room and take a course from a great scientist who was outside of my field of concentrated study, a man named Roger Revelle, who was the first scientist to measure CO2 in the atmosphere. And he really taught uh, everything that's happened since then, he taught. The, the details have been filled in. It's been known for a long time. How do we... Um, communicate to enough of the world's people that the danger of losing a tolerable, sustainable future for all future generations is, is real and requires us to act now. It's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. We are, uh, we, are develop, we developed in ways that cause us to react instantly to the kinds of threats that our ancient ancestors survived. Mm -hmm. If a snake were to wriggle across this stage, people would clear out without thinking about it. But a threat that's far worse, that can only be perceived and understood by using our reasoning capacity, that requires communication. It requires um, a shared mm -hmm. commitment. We, the good news is we do have that capacity. It's not automatic. 
but we do have that capacity. The great cathedrals of Europe were built by multiple generations over centuries because the value embodied was important enough that they would devote their lives as would their children and then their grandchildren. This generation of people alive right now is at a moment when the hinge of history is swinging. We have a decision to make. We're beginning to make the right decision, but it has to have that emotional component and it has to have a spiritual component. Climate crisis is the outward manifestation of an inner spiritual crisis, and more and more people are realizing that. You, you had this idea in 1998 about a satellite that you planned for. It seems to be happening. Oh, thank you for asking that question. Just a few days ago, the satellite reached its station in space, so I'll tell the story briefly. Uh, you remember I put up the slide of the blue marble that, uh, I don't know if we can put that slide back up, yeah. That um, was taken 42 years ago. When I went into the West Wing in the White House, uh, I took down, I shouldn't acknowledge this, but uh, m pictures of my predecessors as vice president and put a, a large version of that on, on the wall. And <laughs> after uh, uh, five or six years, I had memorized every uh, detail, and I called NASA and said, I'm ready for another one. And that's when I learned there's not another one. And that was one of the reasons why I proposed a satellite in 1998, mm -hmm. to go out to the L1 point in space, mm -hmm. which is if you have the, the sun here and the earth here, as the earth rota uh, uh, goes around, orbits the sun, a million miles, 1.6 million kilometers from the Earth toward the Sun is the point where the gravitational fields of the Earth and Sun balance out. And so if you put a satellite there, it stays between the Earth and the Sun, and you, all, and you put a camera with a telescopic lens, you always have the Sun behind the lens and you get this picture every day. And it turns out you can also measure the energy balance of the entire planet for the first time. That's what the climate crisis really is. It's not air temperature. It's the heat energy being absorbed. And we've been able to measure the amount coming into the Earth system from the sun. We've never been able to measure it going out. Two, so I propose this satellite. Zero. And liftoff. The Falcon takes flight, propelling the Deep Space Climate Observatory on a million mile journey to protect our planet Earth. Anyway, uh, it arrived. Isn't that amazing. It arrived on station Sunday, and next month, July 15th, we'll get the first uh, image, uh, like the blue marble. And in September, we'll get 14 uh, high-resolution images of the Earth every day. And in October, we'll begin to get the energy balance for the planet for the very first time. So I'm excited about it. So there's no reason to be optimistic. Now, you've also been a green investor yourself. What is, yeah. What has this experience given you? What have you taken from that? It's been a, a fantastic uh, experience. One of the biggest sources of optimism and, and optimism and excitement for me is that the business community around the world is leading the way on this. Not all of them, but it's amazing. Uh, Stotcroft is a premier example, uh, but they're competing for the customers at the margin who care about this, and some of them who've done it initially for that reason or because their spouses or children or executive teams say, hey, why don't we do better? Once they do it, they find out it saves them money and they're more profitable. So I'm excited by it. In the investment marketplace, um, one of the reasons I was so uh, proud of Norway's oil fund for making the decision it did on coal is that it's not only the right thing morally, it's the right thing financially. It's, it's a smart investment decision. So uh, I, I co-founded and chair uh, an investment fund, Generation Investment Management, 
that focuses on sustainable capitalism. All of our investments are through the lens of sustainability, and we give 5% of our profits to a foundation that promotes sustainable capitalism. We don't have time in this forum to talk about sustainable capitalism, but it, it's an important topic. You pay some great tributes to, uh, to StarCraft and to Norway today, but don't you also believe that we, we do have a responsibility? We've made our fortune on oil and gas. Yes, of course, and uh, you're not saying anything that uh, every member of this audience doesn't realize and, and, and feel very, very deeply. I, I'm, I know, I have so many Norwegian friends. And um, yes, and uh, Norway is, uh, in that respect, is just a slightly more extreme example of the world as a whole. We've built our civilization on yeah. fossil fuels. How do we make this transition? But uh, if there was a single country in the world I would bet on to make the right series of decisions, it would be Norway. Thank you so much for spending your time with us here today, for sharing all your ideas. If I was to, um, to summarize your leadership and all you say in one word, I would say visionary. Thank you so much for being visionary and for being here with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.